guest tonight is Lynn Orr. He is the former Undersecretary of the United States Department of Energy. He is also an administrator and educator at Stanford University. But before I say hello to him and start answering, asking him questions, I want to make an announcement. Katerina, Dr. Katerina Powers, this is her gallery, and she is the driving force for putting on this eight-day speaker tour. And I think uh, there's no other gallery in Silicon Valley, or maybe even the entire San Francisco Peninsula, that can put on a speaker tour like she has put on. And I think she does it because she wants to make a great contribution to the community, and she wants to have a real hot gallery, okay? Lynn, how are you today? I'm well. This is the third time I think you and I have gone on camera together. Uh, who's counting? <laughs> <laughs> you be right. I, uh, yes, I think that's right. And I'm especially interested in discussing something with you. And I am tempted to say about Stanford, the most tangible thing it has done to foster education, whatever, in the field of energy and climate change is what a colleague of yours has done, Joe Stegner. He built Stanford's new energy system. Mm -hmm. And I say tangible, not to insult the professors, but people and ideas are important. But on the other hand, a half a billion dollars invested to reduce Stanford's greenhouse gases, lower energy costs, and serve as a model for the rest of the world, I think is very tangible. What uh, do you think? I certainly agree. Um, uh, the good news is that, that uh, in fact, it did take uh, a big capital investment, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, but it also saves uh, hundreds of millions of dollars over the next 30 years or there, thereabouts because the system works by reusing the heat, the, the thermal energy that we take out of buildings all the time. And instead of buying fuel to make hot water to keep those buildings warm, uh, we reuse the heat that we've taken out of the buildings. Now, it takes some plumbing to do this. It takes uh, a, an energy management system that is well thought out. It takes some storage in uh, some nice big tanks that store hot water and chilled water. Um, and it takes some smart people to run it, but uh, uh, it is exactly the kind of thing that we should be doing uh, across the country, which is to use energy more efficiently than, uh, than we do right now. And I have to say, I think we've, uh, we've left ourselves a lot of room to do better on that, uh, on that score. That's about the politest way I could say that. Um, uh, but it, this is an example. And at the same time, it, uh, it reduces our water use by quite a lot. 18% uh, is the number that sticks in my head. Um, water uh, is a primary limit to what we can do uh, on the campus, so uh, reducing our water use by almost 20% is important. And then, of course, it also leads to a quite large reduction in uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the, from the uh, university. We used to have um, a, a pretty efficient combined cycle natural gas power plant, but this system uses much more renewable energy to make the electricity that we then use to, to run heat pumps that remove heat from the uh, chilled water side and push it into the hot water side. So the whole system works together in a way that, uh, that meets some of the goals that so many students and faculty have worked on, uh, on trying to meet uh, as we think about the world's energy systems. I get a kick as you talk about Stanford systems and Joe Stegner's system. You point to painting. I get a kick out yeah, of well, that. Yeah, well, the original cogen plant is over there. Yes. And the, uh, the, the heat pump mm -hmm. system is over here. And we've made a transition for, uh, uh, from one to the other in a way that I think has been, been great. It, I also take my freshman uh, seminar 
kids over to see the new system, and we so we can talk about not only how it works, but uh, the system that it replaced as well. So it's actually quite a useful educational tool at the same time. And I believe you played a role in the decision to motivate motivate the board of directors to spend a half a billion dollars to put the new system in place? Uh, the, the trustees, of course, were very interested in the question of what we were going to do with all the money that, uh, that we were asking to spend. And it's their job to, to protect the financial interests of the, the university. So they wanted to, to, be, uh, to understand uh, how this was going to work, to make sure that we had paid a, uh, enough attention to all the potential pricing scenarios for the electricity that we were going to buy in the, in the marketplace, and that, that we'd really thought through uh, what we were committing to do because it was such a big investment. Um, and so I participated in many of the conversations. We, uh, uh, the trustees were very interested. They had already decided that we should be investing in, um, in uh, energy efficient buildings uh, and this uh, this played a role in that as well um, my wife was a trustee for uh, a decade and uh, and worked on land and buildings so uh, it, we perhaps I was able to persuade her or maybe it was her persuading me I'm not sure which but uh, but in any case um, uh, I certainly participated in all those conversations okay you discovered that France's largest energy company, a one that has 70 billion in sales, owned by the government, and that provides 75%, I believe, of the electricity of France. You discovered that their CEO came to Stanford and as one of the advisors, and he got the idea the system was of great importance, and his company has been documenting uh, Joe's system and plans to bring a version of it across the entire United States. What did you think when you discovered that information? Well, one of the things that, that we did all the way through that whole process was to make sure that we brought in people who uh, were uh, deeply knowledgeable about, uh, uh, about systems like this to to ask them, you know, are we crazy? Are we, uh, are we uh, making sense here? Uh, and to do it not just um, uh, from an overall concept uh, standpoint, but also from the standpoint of quantitative measures of uh, performance of the system. Uh, and having uh, someone who really knows the business from start to finish um, is, uh, is a useful part of that. The idea that we might be able to take what we've learned in working on this system and apply it much more broadly, uh, I think fits entirely with the educational mission of the university. Uh, we'd like to see others uh, take advantage of, uh, of uh, our experience here and, uh, and make systems that would work just as well. So it's, uh, it's consistent with practically everything we do. So you brought up education and you, agreed that Joe's system might be the most tangible contribution that Stanford has given us with respect to energy policies, et cetera, direction, climate change. What would somebody like Paul Ehrlich think of that statement? Boy, predicting what Paul will say is, um, <laughs> is a, a risky business. Um, <clears throat> but I think he would agree that um, that the, we, we not only want to think about all kinds of, uh, of the research that we do, but we also want to, to uh, operate the campus in a way that reflects the, the, the knowledge and the values that, uh, that so many of us uh, share. Uh, so I, I, I think he'd be, uh, be pleased with this. Now, I, I'm, I might be forced to disagree with you uh, a little bit here, Michael. Um, this is certainly the, the, a hugely important, tangible reason. If you're willing to let me integrate over a long period of time and think about all the accomplishments of all the students who flow through this place and who learn something about it, 
and count all their accomplishments, then that might be bigger than uh, bigger than this. But uh, yes. I agree. I agree that requires some assumptions. Now, are you the founder of the Precourt Energy Institute at Stanford? Well, I was the the founding director. So founding director. Uh, I, I think. Uh, uh, Mr. Precourt, who made a big contribution to help fund it, is probably should get the, uh, some of the credit as well. See, Exxon? Was he Exxon? Precourt? No, he, he, he was involved in the natural gas industry, but I, I don't think he was uh, uh, involved with Exxon. Okay, I'd like to know how folks over there speak. Sally Benson, I think, is one of the co-directors. Right. How would she think about your statement <laughs> my statement, but you agreed with it that Joe's system is the most tangible. How would she take that? Yeah, I think she'd agree. You think she'd agree? Wow, that's amazing. So, uh, um, you know, uh, do you know how many academics it takes to have an argument? <laughs> Just one. one. We'll disagree with ourselves. Uh, you know, the, on the one hand, the other hand. So, uh, uh, trying to make some, a, a deeply categorical statement like that is certain to provoke a, a discussion. But it would be a fun discussion to have in the sense of trying to think about all the things that we do to try to make the university a more sustainable place. Now, you founded or became the head, I believe, of several other departments, projects at Stanford. Mm -hmm. Which one or two do you feel were the most important? Well, certainly university-wide. Um, we began in the early 2000s um, on something called the Global Climate and Energy Project. Uh, and this was a roughly $200 million project over a 10-year period uh, aimed at reducing greenhouse gas emissions associated with energy use. The wide-ranging program, proposal competitions, uh, work funded both at Stanford and at other universities around the world. And uh, I think that was uh, a big contribution. It wasn't me by myself by, by any means. It was a whole lot of people working on it. But what it allowed us to do was to, to focus attention of a bunch of really talented uh, graduate students and faculty members and research staff uh, to find a way to, uh, to modify the world's energy systems to make them much cleaner. Um, and it, it had a transformative impact on Stanford just as a, because it, what it did was to build bridges amongst research groups that were very capable of working on all kinds of interesting um, energy things, but not necessarily talking to each other. So the experience of, of that, um, that big project was in the end what led to the formation of the Energy Institute. We began to see that, uh, that there was a lot that we needed to do we had our, uh, this technical project uh, uh, that had a, a, a broad focus but didn't encompass all of the energy research on campus uh, and that we needed to bring that together with, uh, with everything else that was, uh, was going on in the, on the energy front and that, that was the Precord Institute. So one kind of led to the other. Okay, this Global Energy Initiative, was it 250 million? To 225 originally, Jeff. Okay. What was one tangible accomplishment besides leading to a new organization direction at Stanford? Well, uh, gosh, I could, you, oh. you, you probably don't have enough time for me to talk about all the fun things. But I, I'll give you one, just because it really illustrates the, the, um, the power of ideas. So you know that um, when the sun shines on all of us, we warm up, yes, and then we re-radiate back to the to the the to space three degrees Kelvin out there. So the that goes as the temperature each of us radiates a temperature to the fourth power. So so we're just pushing thermal energy back uh, towards space all the time. Now the issue with green greenhouse gases is that they intercept part of that energy. Um, and retain it in the atmosphere. Um, when the Earth is in balance, the amount of heat going out is just exactly balances what's coming in. But as we've added greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, we capture a bit more of that, uh, and so we're now we're busy warming the planet. Now, so you say, well, is there a way that we could 
could push some of that thermal energy out through the atmosphere without having it be intercepted by the greenhouse gases? And the answer is that yes, there is. There are certain portions of the, the spectrum of light that, for which the atmosphere is clear. So what you need to do is to have, find a material that, can, um, that you can use, say, a building to warm that material and then have that material reject that, that energy uh, back towards space. So the idea was cooked up first by uh, a, an electrical engineer, a largely a theoretician, Sean Hui Fan. Um, and then his team went to work, and they have a material. They built one. There's now a little company that's, uh, that's uh, working to commercialize this idea. And the thing that's so good about this is that it doesn't require um, uh, any energy to work. It, uh, you just, well, that's not quite fair. You still have to, you still have to transfer the, the heat from the building. So that takes a pump and some fluid or, uh, uh, or something like that. But it's not like a vapor compression air conditioning system uh, that, uh, that, that requires lots of energy to actually do the, the heat transfer once you get it to the, to the, um, to the air conditioner. Now, if you think about the world that uh, we're headed for, where uh, some of the hot places are going to be a good bit hotter, uh, it will be very helpful to have uh, low energy cost ways to transfer some of that to provide cooling uh, in big parts of the world. Now, this, we have some more work to do to bring this to, to, to make it more efficient, to bring it to full commercial activity. But it's a, an example where you take a, a group that, that um, uh, has, has fantastic, wonderful uh, ideas in the electrical engineering realm and then apply that to, to solving a, a, a greenhouse gas problem in a way that, uh, that brings something entirely new to the party. Okay. What other organizations did you either found or became the director of at Stanford. Hmm. I mean, I, I look at a, your bio and it, you know, I mean, well, it's I was you a, have more accomplishments uh, there than uh, I have uh, here. No, well, it's uh, <laughs> it's a uh, I was a department chair and then I was a dean of the of the School of Earth Sciences. It was called then. It's Earth Energy and Environmental Sciences now. Um, and then I stepped down from that to, to work on uh, starting the Global Climate and Energy Project. Uh, and then I stepped down from that, um, and, and by the way, I had had the good sense to hire Sally Benson from stealing her from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab um, to, to help run GSEP, the Global Climate and Energy Project. And then when, when I went to work on uh, getting the Precord Institutes started, <coughs> Sally took over that. And then, then when I went to Washington to work at the Department of Energy, she... Uh, she stepped in to be the Precord uh, Institute director as well. So the, I think the single smartest thing I did was to hire her. Really? Yeah, I've attended one of her conferences once, and I thought it was a wonderful conference, and, uh, and I thought she handled herself nicely. And doesn't she have a partner there, and he's an Indian fellow? Yeah, Arun Majumdar. He's a, he's a mechanical engineering professor, um, and... Uh, uh, we, he had been the director of a program called ARPA-E uh, at, um, at the Department of Energy. And sure. when he left the Department of Energy, we were able to, to uh, talk him into coming to Stanford with a little detour uh, through Google to work on international energy and things oh, uh, there as well. So, um, so yes, we're very good. To, there turns out there's a lot to do to run an interdisciplinary institute, and of course the faculty members who do this have their own labs and research programs to run. So, um, so we try to let them do both. Now, a little while ago, you said there's many fun stories I could tell, right? You said something like that? I, yeah, I heard possible. you. <laughs> uh, as undersecretary of I, the United States Department of Energy, mm -hmm. what was the most fun thing and I know what it was. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. What? What? Well, was I can it? tell you what I liked most about the job. 
that was, uh, that was the mandate to stick my nose in, in all the areas of research that the Department of Energy funds. Now, I had the, so the Department of Energy has three parts. It owns the nuclear weapons stockpile for the country and has to make sure that it would work if needed and it's protected and safe. Nothing to do with me, thank goodness. There's a part of the Department of Energy that works on cleaning up after making all those nuclear weapons in the Cold War period, also not me. And then the third part was the part I got to look after, which was the science and energy program. So this, this uh, includes 10 national labs as part of the Office of Science, uh, SLAC, Lawrence Berkeley, um, Oak Ridge, um, Argonne, Brookhaven. Um, and programs that involve uh, high energy physics, nuclear physics, fusion, uh, basic energy sciences, uh, uh, biological and environmental uh, research. So uh, a rich program of science programs and then also a set of, uh, of applied energy programs. Uh, nuclear uh, energy, the uh, uh, National Renewable um, uh, Energy uh, um, lab and uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy um, and then the fossil energy programs as well and then the office of electricity that worked on all the grid kind of stuff so there was a big sandbox to play in it was a big budget to get ready every year but the best part was, was the fact that uh, i could uh, you know i could say gee I, I don't get this quantum computing thing. Get somebody in here to explain this to me. Yeah. And sure enough, a day or two later, a, a, a world expert on this no, not, not. would come uh, uh, try to explain in words of one syllable how the heck uh, that works. To be honest, I still don't get it, but it, uh, it, was, uh, it was really uh, fun to be able to do this. I can tell you that I know a heck of a lot more about neutrino physics now than I did uh, when I went to DOE because because we had a big project to, that, that was going to require international participation to make neutrinos in Chicago and send them to South Dakota to a deep underground mine where there's a detector uh, to try to sort out the physics of the fact that there are three kinds of neutrinos and they tend to switch back and forth and we don't really understand that as well as we need to. Okay. So, so that, that, that absolutely was the fun part of the job. I have heard you had Another, there's another thing that you found to have be of great fun. You could walk down the hallways and you had five, six, <laughs> ten assistants no, no, walking that's with you. That's an exaggeration, you. Michael. That's a... And you could say, well, I think this, and one of them would jump up and take off with it, and then another one. And that that was sort of fun well, it did, for you. It did take some getting used to the fact that um, they never let me out of the office by myself. Um, I always had a staffer with me, and at first I kind of chafed at this because um, I, I said, you know, I, I'm a big boy. I can cross the street without somebody holding my hand. Um, but I pretty quickly figured out that, that the way the day was scheduled, it was one meeting back to back uh, with another, uh, and that all the things that we decided we were going to do in that first meeting, I was never going to have time to sit down and send all the emails to get things going. And so I really did need that staffer to help, uh, um, help coordinate that. And then, of course, what would sometimes happen is that the, the, um, the schedule for the day would get blown up because the secretary would be called to the White House for some uh, discussion about the Iran nuclear agreement. And I would walk out of one meeting, and the, that staffer would, who'd been talking to the office would hand me a folder and say, this is the speech the secretary was going to give at the uh, ACS uh, uh, meeting across town. It'll take about 20 minutes to get there in the, in the car. You have that time to make this yours um, <laughs> as you get to go uh, represent the secretary. Now, uh, the first time this happened, I say it was, I, it was terrifying. Uh, but I pretty quickly figured out that if I was going to be the substitute, then the chances were it was something that had to do with things that I uh, was involved with. So you get, get used to that sort of thing as well. But you do, you do have to, in jobs like that, you have to rely on the talented people around you. Uh, and uh, one lesson that I learned pretty fast is that DOE was rich in, in a very 
capable people working very, very hard to try to do a good job. We jump to another topic. You know, there are many, many utilities in the United States and around the world. Mm -hmm. And I think they're facing new challenges like maybe never before. And maybe you could state what you think three of the greatest challenges are that they face. Well, I think utilities, uh, they're under pressure um, for uh, a variety of reasons. One, one set of rules come from the public utilities commissions that, that govern how utilities provide service. Um, and those, they also set rules about how the markets work, how, how um, whether, and there are different kinds of markets across the utility space. There, there are regulated markets and then there are uh, the unregulated ones where, where utilities are really becoming much more just purchasers and deliverers of power. And then there are all the stresses that come from people like me who um, have solar cells in, on their roof or in their backyard. Mine are in the backyard because putting them on the roof was going to require cutting down the redwood tree and that was going to cause a divorce. So, um, so that, uh, that didn't seem like a good idea. Uh, but anyhow, I, I actually make at my house more uh, all the electricity we use and then a little bit uh, besides. Um, I pay a very modest charge for uh, being able to use power at nighttime when my solar cells are not doing the job. Um, and, uh, and so the utility gets a little bit of money, but probably not as much as they should get from me for all the services that I require. That I require. So it's, you know, that's a balancing of market structures. Um, uh, markets right now don't give as much credit for um, for low greenhouse gas emissions. Um, uh, there are portfolio standards in some places. There's just a whole lot of ferment about how we organize the markets and how we manage these complex systems uh, all at the same time. And utilities have, because they make long-term investments, they have to, to figure out how to navigate all of that. And what about mobility? Well, now there's, a, there's an interesting uh, challenge, you know. You can begin to see uh, a world in which uh, transportation is electrified, certainly in urban settings in a big way. Um, that will require delivery of, uh, of power to the, all those vehicles that want to be charged, but will also um, require that, um, <coughs> that they uh, do it at the right time of day. And that interacts with all these other market structures in interesting ways. You know, there are some markets in the United States now where, where electricity prices are actually negative um, for when there's too much wind or solar all at once and because of those are given priorities in the marketplace and because there's still some subsidies there. So um, uh, learning to take advantage of all of that, uh, supply the energy that's needed and at the time that it's needed, um, those, are, those are big complicated challenges and the utilities yes. uh, uh, have to figure out how to do that. So Lynn, we could go on and on and have you entertain us and educate us, but we have run out of time. And Lynn, again, thank you very much. I'm Michael Killen, our guest has been Lynn. Some might say we have gone on and on. Uh, <laughs>